In this show, The Nature of the Beast, I'm showing six paintings. They're one series made over a period of about four years. And they're the life-size paintings of prize-winning stock bulls. Um, this is the first painting that I made in the series. And it's a bull called Tally. Um, I became fascinated by the images of these creatures when I uh, saw bulls on show at a, a livestock um, show in Ireland. And it was the kind of immense power and strength of them that fascinated me. And I wanted to make a series of paintings that really uh, gave the people looking at them, gave the people looking at the paintings a sense of being next to the creature itself. So the paintings, the bulls in the paintings are exactly the same size as the real bulls. I found the bulls by uh, looking, uh, searching on the internet, made contact with the farms that were using these bulls as, uh, for breeding, um, made an arrangement to go and photograph them. would take about 100 photographs of each animal. Um, long shots which would get the whole silhouette in and lots and lots of surface detail photographs. Uh, when I came to make the paintings, all of these photographs are put together in different layers to make the image of the painting. And um, for me, it was uh, continuing an idea that's run through the work for a long time, which is the idea of the specimen, the thing that's um, identified as uh, representing something, thing that's picked out to represent uh, a species. And um, I wanted the paintings to just show the bulls on a plain ground um, with no sense of a, a, a context in which they might be living. I mean, f one of the ways I describe these paintings is being like, um, where English naive painting meets American minimalism. But, so they have a kind of physical uh, sense of being there, but there's a kind of directness about the way the description works. The painting says, this is a bull, this is what it looks like, and this is, and this is, what it, this is the size it is. Um, but for me, the, the, the making of the painting, and they made over a period of about three months building the image up in lots and lots of layers was a way of um, investing it with the kind of physical energy that the animal itself had through from a sense of the, uh, the skeletal structure of the creature, the muscles, uh, right through to the, the details of the surface where you get the eyelashes or the tears that are coming out of the eye in one of them or the hairs that are coming uh, down around the ear. Um, so the making of the painting for me was really important in terms of how this, how's it, how this thing has meaning and how it exists. Um, so although the, the photographs are used as a way of gathering information, um, they don't kind of tell you how to make the painting. That's something that goes on on the surface as it's being made. Some decisions were quite important, like whether to put a shadow underneath the hooves or not. Um, and I decided not to, so that the, the, the space around the bull becomes ambiguous in the sense that uh, whether, whether, whether this is an image or whether it's a thing in a space. Um, I was really thinking a lot about uh, the George Stubbs painting, Whistle Jacket, um, as a kind of historical precedent for this kind of painting, which is a, a life-sized painting of a horse on a plain ground. Um, it's in the National Gallery in London. And when you see it, it, it looks extraordinarily contemporary in relation to every, every other work around it. Um, I, I kind of decided on six bulls. I think there'll be one more in the series that I'm planning, which, which would obviously make seven. And, uh, I was thinking of the um, Janice Kunalis piece, of Seven Horses, in a gallery where he showed seven live horses in a gallery. And I wanted the paintings to have that kind of sense. So that the painting is, is, uh, is the specimen, in a sense. The painting becomes the animal. And your experience of the painting 
is like being in front of the thing itself. These are all animals that have won prize in shows there. So in that sense, they're, they're incredibly uh, valued by the people that own them. And um, they're used for breeding on the farm that they, um, they live on, but also they're, they're, they're kind of sold as breeding stock to other farmers. Um, and Tally, who was the first one that I, I painted, um, is quite famous, I think. When he's finished his breeding life, he'll just be put out into the fields and le left to roam happily. But I, 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 I said to the guy who was looking after him, does he get nervous about being photographed like this? And he said, no, people come and photograph him all the time. So, um, and they have very different temperaments. He was very mild. He's a Charolais bull on a Charolais farm in Kent. Um, there's another painting uh, of a bull from the same farm. There are two Simmentals from a farm near Oxford. Uh, a British blonde, um, which was a bull uh, in a farm in Ireland, and a um, uh, red pole. So uh, th th there's something about the choosing and selection of the animals which is very um, arbitrary. It's just seeing something online, thinking, that's the one I want to do. Um, so in a way, I think my approach to the subject is very like a kind of amateur naturalist, a 19th century amateur naturalist, you know, which is where decisions are made based on uh, whims and desires rather than any kind of uh, attempt at a, a scientific understanding or exploration of a subject. And that's been important to me in terms of not just this series, but the previous work where I was working uh, with museum collections, particularly the Natural History Museum collection. Um, it was a kind of, um, uh, yeah, a reawakening of the idea of a, an, an amateur engagement with a, with a subject that's, that's very defined in terms of the way the scientists approach it. This is a show called Our Creatures, which is a show that I was invited to curate alongside The Nature of the Beast. And I wanted to do a historical exhibition that connected to the work that I was showing, the bull paintings. Um, so these are portraits of animals, really. They're paintings, drawings, sculpture, and taxidermy. And what interested me about these, they're predominantly 19th century, was that as well as being a, a, a picture of the animal, they expressed a relationship between people and animals. And I wanted to put a show together that gave you glimpses of the different kinds of relationships that existed. So there are livestock animals, there's a portrait of a bull, uh, pigeons um, and pets. The, the, the pets are mainly dogs that we've got here. And um, it was a convention in the 19th century to um, have an animal that was really well loved, stuffed and mounted and brought back into the house. So here we've got um, a stuffed dog from the Horniman Museum collection. And what I wanted to do with this one was actually show how after the animal's been um, stuffed and is then collected by a museum, the, the idea of it being kind of um, nurtured and uh, preserved is still there. So the packing that you can see, this is how the dog actually exists in the um, storage depot of the museum, in the box with the tissue paper around it. And I wanted to give some sense of this idea that this relationship between people and animals is something that continues even after the the, the owners of the dog have, have give, given it up to a museum. Uh, we've got a sculpture of Epstein's dog, made by him, along with a photograph of him with the dog on his lap. Um, we've got taxidermy, as I said, taxidermy um, specimens from the Horniman Museum. And the other thing I was really pleased about were the folk paintings from Compton Verney. 
Um, again, they, they have this kind of directness about them in the way that um, someone would have a sheep or a pig that they really valued. They would get an artist to paint it. And um, we've got a painting of a horse. And uh, I think it's just interesting how these build up into a sense of the complex and um, divert and different relationships between people and animals. The, 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 the most interesting ones for me are the Buick woodcuts in which he um, takes images that he's seen and weaves them into stories which um, in some of them are quite kind of shocking and horrific um, in, in terms of the relationships they describe between people and animals. So the, the exhibition goes from animals that are most loved to animals that are most despised and reviled, really, and gives a kind of uh, uh, glimpses of all the different possibilities that um, existed. So um, I'm in the middle of installing uh, my piece in this show. And so far, we've hung a swarm of about, I think it's about 200 bees. And the idea is that they are a swarm of bees controlled by skeleton fairies who raided their hive, and now they're using them as a weapon. And they're controlling them, um, they're making them swarm down towards a python that's slithering through the gallery. So they're pursuing this python. And the fairies are riding in skull ships that they've built from sheep. There's two sheep skulls and a wolf, I think it's a wolf skull. Um, so I think they've hunted those animals previously and, and used their bones to construct these skull ships, which are flown by um, harnessed beetles and butterflies. So the bees have been imprisoned in the ships and they're quite angry. And now they're, they're kind of spurting out of a sort of hose on one of the ships down towards the python. Um, but there's actually competition to catch the python from another gang of fairies who are controlling an army of crabs. The fairies have um, converted some of these crabs into tanks, so as well as their, their claw weapons, um, there's a, a particularly large crab that has attached bones which are catapults, so they're catapulting um, scorpions and ants at the snake, but they've also unleashed an army um, of, of soldier ants that are surging towards the python. Um, but they're, the fairies, because the fairies are competing with each other, they have to, that they're throwing things at each other as well. So the crabs are also flinging objects at the ships to try and take them down. And some, and some of the bees uh, have uh, made their way over to the, the crabs. M my work has revolved around insects and animals for quite a long time. It's, um, the protagonists have always been the skeleton fairies. So I'm exploring the struggle, their struggle for survival within our natural world and their pretty fast um, route towards world domination. So, and their increasingly ingenious methods of um, attack and defence and ways to um, attack larger animals because the fairies are very, they're insect sites. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, and I'm interested in superorganisms, so colonies of, of honeybees and ants, so small things en masse and the power in, in, involved in that. I chose this room because I, I wanted a self-contained immersive installation with quite a, an apparent narrative that you could, but, but that you could walk around everywhere and become really absorbed in the story. And I also wanted it to be contained to increase the, um, the sense of, of threat that I think people will feel from the snake and the swarm of bees and an army of crabs.